How's it going, everyone? Welcome to another PT Pearl as part of the Optimal Body Podcast. I'm Dr. Dom. I'm Dr. Jen. And today we're going to be talking about tendinitis, tendinosis, and tendinopathy, and what those mean and how those words get thrown around and how we can kind of approach mending those things back to health. What are some of the common places people get these tendonitis, osis, and apathies? Shoulder. That's a super yeah. common area. Elbow. A lot of people, I mean, whether you play tennis or not, <laughs> yeah. a lot of people complain of elbow pain, um, especially when they've been working out a lot, do a lot of calisthenics, or mow a lot of lawns. <laughs> a lot of elbow pain. Uh, knees, for sure. Patellar tendonitis. That's probably one that you've heard before. And freet. Absolutely. Feet, which is why we got our Vivo Barefoots on. We're going to chat a little bit about how to know if you're gauging into barefoot shoes right, because it can cause some of these tendonitis and inflammations if we're not doing that right. So being one of the common places you feel that, we'll chat about that a little bit later. But let's talk about the difference between what those three are. Yeah. So tendonitis, the word, the the itis ending kind of means more of a short term or a time span. So this is something that right after we've done a little too much exercise or right after we've done a little too much work say it's like oh the first time i went out for a run and my calves are just way 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 inflamed and swollen the next day that would be more of a tendonitis profile we used to use the word tendinosis a lot because it just means a little more chronic or a little more long term i think a lot of people are kind of gearing towards this word tendinopathy instead. And that is just when it's a little further down the road and there's a few different progressions of tendinopathy. Again, each one of these cases is different and is somewhere along the spectrum we're about to talk about. But just think of it as tendinitis is the initial inflammation. It's the thing that happens initially when we do too much work. And tendinosis or tendinopathy, we're going to use tendinopathy a little bit more, is what happens in the long term. And when we see some more chronic degenerative type changes. In the very beginning stage, so tendonitis, it is that one initial onslaught of automatically I went from running like nothing to (laughs) running five or eight miles, you know, when people all of a sudden kind of jump the gun and what they're doing is a repetitive movement over and over again. So when it becomes this tendinopathy that it's stuck around for over six weeks and you're still getting that repetitive pain, it's from a repetitive overuse injury. It's the easiest way to think about it because if say it's in the shoulder and I just continue to you know, reach overhead or do something at my job repetitively over and over and over again and I'm not doing anything different to kind of switch up that positioning within my body, within my upper back or anything else, I'm going to continue to run into that problem over and over again. So say it lasts over six weeks, it kind of turns into more of that tendinopathy. Same with the elbow. If I'm just kind of twisting, oh, I feel that pain coming back yeah. again. A lot of people who do manual labor or work or sports, I mean, are really common because the repetitive nature mm-hmm. and doing it maybe a little awkwardly or a little yeah. suboptimally or putting a little too much force through that movement repetitively is another thing that is going to kind of perpetuate that cycle of that tendon. This is where some people will say, oh, I'm not doing anything. It just hurts. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, what's one thing we do more repetitively than anything? Walk or just stand. And if we're not putting the, you know, good pressure and good force through our hip tendons or our knee tendons, that's where we can develop these repetitive strains that turn into tendonitis and tendinopathies. So your tendon is what is attaching from the muscle to a bone where a ligament so you might see like if you look at a skeleton or you go look at the body exhibits which is actually really cool those are super cool (laughs) um and you see those white connective tissue when it goes bone to bone that's a ligament okay what we're talking about right now is a tendon so it's still coming from that muscle belly but now we're coming to the very end where it becomes less of that bright pretty pinky red color and it becomes more of that connective tissue that is just white and going into the bone so that is what a tendon is and the load and the force of that tendon responds differently than the load and the force of a muscle especially when it we're talking about repair and healing and so that's why it can kind of take on 
that repetitive strain and stress, especially if we're looking at right at a joint, right? Because our muscle is what's doing the movement, but our tendon at that joint, if we're repetitively going into one certain area and not kind of rebalancing with other areas, right? That's where we can kind of get that build up, that overload. And finally, that tendon's like, yo, I can't take it anymore. And one thing that you said is that tendons respond a little differently to this loading and and than muscles do. And that's because tendons have a lot less vascularization or they get a lot less of this nutrients that helps with healing, that just helps all of these processes because they're so compact and they take a lot of force that not a lot of vasculature can reach in there. So when they do get damaged, it takes them a little longer to kind of heal or at least feel benefits because we'll talk a little bit about the images and what the image means and whether that means we're going to have pain and we talk about that in a lot of other cases too but um, initially we just need to focus on what kind of pressures we're putting through that repetitively and how we're moving through the rest of our body to support that specific area. Um, There's three different stages of tendinopathy that is I think important for everyone to know. Now we're gonna get a little bit clinical here. So yeah, a bear little bit. with us right now just so that you start to understand it. And I remember this is a spectrum. We're going all the way from this tendinitis we were talking about, just this initial inflammation, the tendon starting to react and say, oh, what's going on around me? To now we've have some late stage tissue changes and stuff. And that's kind of what the last stage of tendinopathy we're going to talk about is. So as we go through these, if you if you aren't understanding some of the clinical terms, just understand we're going from pro- progressively, you know, degenerating further down this tendinopathy path. And what happens, you know, in that tissue is that it is going to start to physically change based on what is happening. So our body takes on inflammation anytime that it starts to feel like it needs to respond to something that's happening, to a stress, to an overload. And it is when that inflammatory stage continues to build in that place that it starts to become problematic and can start to change and literally we can see different images. Yeah and I'll briefly run through how that process kind of courses through these three stages of this tendinopathy. What was the first one? Reactive tendinopathy right? So reactive tendinopathy is early stage and this is when our tendon is saying oh crap, he's loading us a lot and he's doing it repetitively. (laughs) What do we do? Our body's really smart and it reacts by loading in more collagen fibers. So it's stronger and able to take that load. We keep overloading it and we keep causing that inflammation. Then we get into tendon disrepair, which is this next stage where we start to get these pockets and we start to get this separation of the collagen because It's just repairing and re-repairing and adding in more collagen at a rate that we can't sustain now. And it's been this inflammatory state for a long time. And all these chemical messengers are getting a little confused like, oh, are we rebuilding? Are we resting? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. And you start getting all these gaps and fissures in the tissue. And it's at this point when it's not as reversible, right? It starts getting to the point where we have our tendon will appear on an image and we'll see these things on an image. And some of those things might not be reversible to get that tendon back to how it originally looked. There are still some aspects of it that can, um, but yeah. it's definitely more in that reactive stage where we can see, okay, if I really take off load and I get back into rest, not meaning <laughs> complete rest, but <laughs> rest from that area, which we'll go mm-hmm. into a little bit more, that's when we can really start to get right back into full repair. And then the last one is just um, degenerative degenerative tendinopathy which is where these kind of gaps in these areas almost harden down and what happens is it's called cell apoptosis which is the death of the cell so we have all of these patches of our tendon that just actually are not viable tissue not working well Um, and that doesn't mean we do have a lot of the tendon left that still is viable tissue and this is where we'll talk about how to rehab or repair back from you know these types of diagnoses We still have tissue that is viable and good and will react well if we start on a good progressive path. But that's kind of that late stage that we see it on the image. That's even a little bit less reversible. But again, that doesn't correlate to the pain the person's feeling or the function. I mean, that is everything that we talk about. You can't just look at an image and say, oh, that's why I have my pain. Can it relate to it? For sure. But can it dictate? No, because we can image other people who have tendons that might look 
you know, in that last pa- in that last stage of degeneration, and they don't have pain. So we can still progress. We can still load you. We just have to do it a little bit smarter. So let's talk about what could be happening in these different areas and how people can start to kind of what does it mean to take off load first of all. Because I think when people think take off load, that means rest. Now I don't do anything. Now I just sit and I ice and I elevate and I just don't move. To put it simply, um, you know, our body has a certain tolerance. And, you know, say our tolerance is 100%. Or for those that are watching, I'm holding my hands up in front of me at a certain <laughs> level. If all of a sudden we start going to 130% and doing that every day and doing that, you know, consistently over months and months, that's where we're doing that overworking and we're gonna start having that chronic tendon issue. If we then go down to 80 to 70% again and do that chronically, the tendons will adapt and we'll be under training. So again, that from that 100% of what our tendon tolerance is all the way to zero is a huge range. And it doesn't mean we never do anything. It means we find that tolerance so that if we are having pain and symptoms, we keep the pain and symptoms at an acceptable level Mm -hmm. which again they use the pain scale and they say maybe a three or four and it's again very arbitrary but lower levels of pain in those workouts so taking off volume is going to be very specific based on subjectively what you say afterwards like oh man i got a little sore but it didn't stick around for longer than 36 48 hours you might be ready to do another training session at that point. And so we looked in some of the studies. Yes, you want to wait between 36 to 48 hours before you go back. So say it's your shoulder that's been giving you issues, okay? You're not gonna do another upper body weight workout where you have a lot of increased tension for 36 to 48 about that time. You also wanna look at that pain scale from three to four out of 10 saying, what does it feel like the next day? So it's not just in the moment of how much pain do I have, but it's literally 24 hours later as well. How much pain do I have? Because in some cases you might not feel it when you're doing the exercise, but you might feel it a lot more the next day. When we talk about taking tension off, especially in the very beginning when you're having those alert systems and, and that pain, that is why I go back to things like mobility and looking at the areas above and below and it doesn't just mean mobility so this is if my knee is really feeling a lot of patellar tendonitis tendinopathy how can i focus more on what my ankles and what my feet are doing like building up the strength in my foot building up the mobility and tolerance of my ankle how can i focus on my hips how can i bring more strength and power to my hips while not loading on the knees. And there's a lot of different exercises that we know of now that don't have to go into a deep squat that put pressure on the knees and can still load the hips and gain strength. So this is where understanding that I can still move and I'm not con- I'm not 100% taking pressure off, but you can take pressure off without directly affecting that area. And a lot of the times when we scale back to that much lower percentage or volume of work, especially when we reduce the volume of work for the knee specifically and for the overall body, that's a really good time to start focusing on those things that positionally we might not but not have been doing super great, where mm-hmm. it's the repetitive thing in an awkward position. You know, if you're using your lawnmower, don't always have your wrists cocked way back. Then you're going to get tennis elbow and you might never touch a tennis racket in your life. (laughs) I always think it's funny because so many people come in with these things and the majority of people never tennis or golf or do anything. They get it from something else. So seek out during this time those positions that may have been slightly less optimal, especially in the workouts and the movements you do. If you walk, if you run, if you do squats or whatever it may be that you're doing, start to be a little more critical in assessing how you're doing those things. And are you coming out of it? Like, say you are in a more extended position, even if you're at your keyboard and you're kind of having your hands, your your wrists back a little bit more throughout the day, or you're, again, on that lawnmower kind of pushing it, or you're getting pain maybe more on the inside of that elbow and kind of from twisting motions or like pulling or whatever you might be doing. Think of are you coming out of that? And that's why, again, I go to mobility assessments. Like, can your muscles even, remember the tendon attaches to the muscle. So if your muscle is super tight all the time and you're just coming into that shortened position and trying to put force through it without ever getting it to lengthen, without ever getting it to relax. Like, of course you're gonna have more tissue tension. Of course you're gonna build up more tolerance and overload. And again, why it's important to do mobility and not just every now and then, but actually 
every single day. And I promise you, you start to program it in, it's going to feel better. It's so crazy, but it is. It's funny because last month I had a goal to do mobility every day. This month I do not. Last mm. month I moved significantly differently mm. as far as daily, what my routine was like. And I was on a little bit of a better routine anyway, but that mobility daily, even if it was just five or 10 minutes while I was making the coffee, definitely made a difference. Yeah. Definitely made a difference in how my different joints are feeling. So mm. it's the consistency that'll get you. It's so true. And, it, and remember that even a stretch is putting tolerance and load onto a tissue. Obviously not as intensely as if you were loading up with weight yeah. um, or doing a movement, but it's still going to be that initial kind of force. So if you are having a lot of pain at the knee, a lot of pain at the elbow, the shoulder, the feet, whatever it may be, like start by putting a stretch into it. And then you can see about loading it more and more later on with different kinds of movements. But, you know, always coming back to assess, don't guess, why am I put, putting more strain and stress? Where can I be not moving as well from and how can I test that? Obviously, there's, at least for mobility, I have a self-assessment that you can do um, in terms of strength and imbalances in your body in that way. Go see a physical therapist. Yeah, and that's the other thing about this whole discussion about tendinopathy. The bummer is there's a whole bunch of different kinds. Yeah. And if you're not trained to do this yourself, what we're saying is just like reading from a dictionary right now. You, you need somebody to kind of help guide you through it sometimes. And we need you need somebody to be a little more thoughtful about, okay, what stage are you in? Because mm -hmm. if we're in that early stage tendinopathy, where we're just accruing all these different fibers, if we immediately just go more to rest and unloading that tendon at that point, then we can actually redirect a lot of that healing and not have significant change in how that tendon looks and get back to function and reduce pain. You know, once we get into the other stages, we might not have a rest stage. We might just set the amount of work we're doing today, adjust the way we're doing things. So at each stage, you're going to do things slightly differently. And so if it is something that's been screaming at you, your body is worth going to get checked because all we can tell you is you're, you're loading it repetitively. We don't know why. We don't know the position. We don't know. We haven't assessed you individually, right? And there's so many different areas of the body that, can, that could be taking place and be the cause of it. So yeah, you want to take a step back, but why? Where can we take a step into? If we're going to take, like, that's what you always have to be cautious and aware of. If I'm going to pull back from my shoulder, where do I need to go into? And that's maybe shoulder blade, rib cage, thoracic yeah. movement. Like, you have to, when we when we take something away, we should be adding something in that we've been neglecting. And that's a huge portion of actually working with a physical therapist in person that can really help you to get back into the assessment of what that is that you need to add in rather than just ice and rest. While you were saying that, I was going to say my least favorite recommendation ever. Or when someone <laughs> comes to me is like, well, I saw a doctor or a family practice or whoever. And again, it doesn't matter who they saw. But if you just say, oh, just rest, just give it about a week or two's rest and then, then get back to it. And it's like, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> what do you mean? And what are we fixing? And how are we going to address the underlying issue as to why they developed that in the first place? Yep. And in that case, we're just asking to get into more of the chronic cycle mm -hmm. because then we'll reintroduce the load. We'll have the same stimuli. We'll have the same reaction. We'll have the pain again. We'll be like, what the heck? Yeah. And then before we get with somebody, it's already been six months. So that's where being a little more critical about how we think about these things and not just stopping, but changing something is going to change the result. Exactly. And how long is it going to take? Again, we can look at the literature for this, but it depends. It depends on exactly what Dom was saying, how, where you are in your stage. And you know what? If it takes up to a year or over a year, is that worth getting out of the pain? I would say, yeah. So try not to let the timelines stop you. It can yeah. seem very daunting, but imagine how much you've been repetitively doing this motion. It could be for years. So expecting something to take a year or six months to start to feel better. Yeah, that might happen. And that's yeah. okay. That's normal. But that means that you're on the journey with your body. And that's why we do wear things like Vivo Barefoot Shoes. Oh, absolutely. I love the Vivos. Um, Roll it up. <laughs> again, this is one of the things that you got to see. Is your shoe flexible? Is your shoe thin? And is your shoe wide? And those wow. are the things that Vivo love to say. And we mentioned barefoot at the beginning of this episode, just talking into, oh, if you go and grab a barefoot shoe and put it on and just start 
walking all day every day in that or even going on a run in that Mm -hmm. you might be sorely mistaken in the morning literally because your feet and your calves will be on fire just because our body isn't used to that load and so when we start wearing barefoots i start i've been wearing barefoots maybe like just over a year now year a couple months um really starting slow or just starting in your bare feet more often if you wear slippers around the house try to go barefoot a little more if you are wearing big big shoes outside every time you go outside or just going to get the mail walk outside in your barefoot see how it feels and then maybe when you go on a grocery run or you're just going to be out for an hour put your barefoot shoe on come back home and kind of like we were talking about with how we assess in tendinopathy give it 24 hours see how your feet and ankles feel and then do it again you know maybe 36 to 48 hours later and then eventually you can get up to wearing it for four hours a day or going out for a two three hour walk or going for a hike and not having a lot of that increased tension or load that your tendons aren't used to on your feet And we seriously, now we wear Vivo barefoot every single day. Um, And it's just what our feet literally prefer to move in. And we've been conditioned into thinking that we need a shoe with more arch support, more cushion, more, more, more. Yeah. And the reality is we don't. We need to more, more, more use our foot. We've, We've kind of, you know, in the past just conditioned our way out of it. But we get to start to really push into it because it can be so beneficial when you actually learn how to use your toes you space out your toes so that they can start to work again and then that's going to activate the bottom of the foot and that's really going to carry you up and honestly in terms of vivo barefoot we wear them because one they're cute i mean come on ladies i get compliments on these all the time (laughs) men do and they give you a hundred day free trial not free. I mean, obviously you're buying them, but you have 100 days to yeah. to return them if you need to because getting used to what type of shoe works for you and what size works for you, you know, it, it, it takes some getting used to because it's a different type of shoe than our feet are worth or used to being in. And like for me personally, I'll just speak on it real quick. I like the knit. So this is the knit um, that we both have mm-hmm. here. Um, I personally, this is my favorite. I wear them all the time and I have them in I think every single color for this one. (laughs) I'm usually a six and a half in women's. Um, They are European sizes. Um, So I go down to a six for the knit, but for the workout shoes, I wear seven. Also because sometimes with the wide toe box, it'll just feel like a little more space than your foot is used to. So sometimes they'll say, go down the size. I still get 13s and I wear a 13 in shoe size and everything else but i do have a really fat wide foot so these things are great for me because i was always used to putting my feet in skinny little things but i'd say that i am more of a fan of the primus light recycled i think it is um it has a little bit of a different kind of angle on it than the the knit but just in general i've really enjoyed coming into this barefoot life and zone i've even started to run in mine a little bit occasionally um and I can just tell how my body's so much more reactive to that ground. Again, that's the thin bottom. Another thing people won't be used to is how thin the bottom is. And you can feel every little thing. You step over a crack or something, you can start to feel those things under your feet. That's what our feet were built for. And if you start adding in those toe exercises that I have all through Instagram, <laughs> literally, I've posted so many. Um, and you wear shoes like this from Vivo. I'm just going to say because they're cute. Um, they're cute. It's you're going to notice a difference not only in your feet but in your whole body and i love when i get dms of feet it sounds weird now (laughs) but now i'm i'm so used to it because it means that people are working on their feet and it makes me so happy and because as pts we get excited by weird things like that (laughs) to know that someone's actually taking my advice i'm like oh you're not just like looking at my post but you're actually doing it that's amazing (laughs) Yeah. yeah um but yeah so Um, obviously, so I did a giveaway for Vivo recently and I had almost 5,000 entries. That's insane. That's crazy. That's the biggest giveaway I've ever seen on my page. So that means people are really interested in trying out the shoe. So if you are, use Optimal 15. Yep. Code Optimal 15 and you get 15% off your Vivo Barefoots. Um, I would also just say, especially during that 100-day trial, give it give it a chance. And if yes. your feet feel sore and stuff after the first few, good, it's working. Yeah. You know, and then take some step back. Remember, don't yep. like wear it all day long like we do now. Yeah. So 
optimal 15 go check out vivo they have that 100 day trial period the link is in our show notes we'll totally. put it right at the top so you can just click that link and go um explore check it out Thanks for joining us for another PT Pearl. And if you like it, if you have comments, concerns, you want a specific area that you want us to dive into a little bit more, we're happy to do that. So drop it in the comments below and let us know. 